Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Rama podcast. I'm your host Lafarius, and in today's show, which is our 60th episode, we will be deep diving into the Adams family. But as usual, before we do that, let's just have a look at some of this week's Amiga news. First up is something I acquired, which was the Commodore story written by David Pleasance. Now this is the full Commodore tale with all that stuff that's never been talked about or even covered in any sort of interviews. It really goes into the full history and all the good and bad stuff that happened behind the scenes. I am three quarters of the way through the book now. It's almost 400 pages long, I think. I've just passed 300 pages. I'm really enjoying it. One thing I did like about it is you can tell that this hasn't been written by something else because it's obvious that David isn't like a, a novelist or a writer he's just trying to put across his own opinion and it offers a very truthful way of it all coming across he doesn't seem to be just like spinning a yarn well he's putting across his side obviously so he's not going to put himself I assume in a bad light but he does a really good job of telling the story as straight as possible and really digging into it it really is a great book and I just bought this completely randomly off the actual website i think it was 29.99 but i was amazed to find that when he posted it to me you know i didn't say i was anything special i just ordered it as normal you know it's not like i'm pushing this off the back of the show and uh, he signed the copy and actually put a little signature inside and i just got it and i was like oh my god this is amazing you know i'm gonna keep this forever so uh, it's now tucked away in the back room i'm gonna finish it up and maybe frame it or cover it in cellophane or something like that i just sound a bit crazy Crazy, doesn't it? Anyway, I am chuffed to bits with it. It's well worth picking up and it's a good read, so I well recommend it. Now, next up is something I noticed after I posted our R type review. I am always a couple of weeks off with the news. That's because I tend to do two shows ahead. I record one for the week for everybody else, and everyone on Patreon on the $4 level, of course, gets to download next week's show a bit early. And of course, I was amazed to see that over on the Facebook page that one of the developers behind R-Type actually step forward. He's called Lutz. Just to say, just to say a few kind words about the episode, I was chuffed to bits he'd even watched it. And he just wanted to make a comment about something I got a bit wrong in the history part. He said, just for the record, we didn't have all of the game engines ready to develop the actual game. We had to create new ones during the short development time we had. So sadly, we couldn't implement parallax scrolling and make the gameplay as arcade perfect as possible for the Amiga. We had to keep to a deadline. Our type was our personal most favourite arcade game. That does come across, by the way, in the game because it's amazing and would have loved to give it our best shot. It's it's the main reason why we started making games at all, but at least we had the chance to do it, which we would have never dreamt of and tried the best we could. So yeah, that completely blew me away. Someone who'd actually been involved in developing a game, stepping forward and making a bit of a correction there. I'm always happy to bring it up, of course, but it just shows that people who were involved back then, they will listen to our stuff and not just me, but other fans as well, because everyone's always making like all these different YouTube videos, other podcasts and articles and write-ups everywhere and a lot of this is stuff like games 20 odd years ago so they will go back and look at it and comment on it from time to time so it's always worth doing your best with whatever you decide to do.
let's take a close look at this week's game, which is the Adams Family. I do have a fair bit of experience with this, especially the Super Nintendo Edition. It was a game that I rented with a few friends and we would like split it between us over several months. I think it was around a Christmas period. It would have been 92, 93, something like that. We became highly addicted to this. It was an awesome platformer on the SNES. So, of course, coming back, I never played it on the Amiga back in the day. So I was very worried that I might not get on with it, you know, see what it was like. Because there is, a, I believe, a big difference between the two versions. And this gets touted as some people's, like, all-time favourite Amiga platformer and one of the best games on the system. And I'm always a bit scared of going back to these ones because someone's always going to get upset with me. But I will try my best and we will dig our heels in and see what we can come up with. The game was published by Ocean Software. They did games like A Train. That's one I keep thinking of going back to on and off. It was a very addictive game as I recall as a kid, but whether or not it holds up today is another question entirely. And I've had discussions on the Facebook page and the Discord room even, just to say like, do you guys actually want me to tackle simulation, these sort of battle games and these longer planning ones? They're not as fast paced as things like platformers or driving games and sports games even they do have their own appeal and i'm a big fan of them but i'm not so sure if everyone who listens to the show is it's something i am seriously considering though anyway let's get back in there sorry the published games uh, next up is chase hq dennis I, I think that's Dennis the Menace, Ivanhoe, Jungle Strike, we've done Desert Strike before, Narc, etc, etc. They were huge and probably the biggest game they did that I've ever covered, I think, is Batman the Movie. Now, the developer, of course, for this was Ocean as well. Again, Batman the Movie, Lethal Weapon, I think that's a similar sort of thing. It's a platformer, something called Skitchin. I wonder if that involves rollerblades or skateboards. It sounds like that sort of a game. Universal Monsters, which never actually got a release, but I think there's a leaked better beta copy out there in the world somewhere. You know, it came out in 1992 and it was only on one floppy disk. It was a single player game and priced at £25.99. Now there's only one coder behind this and he was called James Higgins who was responsible for Navy Seals. I think that's based on a, a very famous film. Graphics by Simon Butler who did games like Nine Lives, Dennis, Elf, Platoon, Total Recall, Worms, etc, etc. Wow, Worms as well, he did work on a lot. And Warren Lancashire, who also worked on Gemini Wing. I think that's a shooter. The music for the game was done by Jonathan Dern, who also did tunes for Batman, Dark Man. I think that's another movie tie-in. Is that the one with Liam Neeson? This is really dredging my memory. Pushover, quite a good game. We did that a long time ago. Rambo 3. Voyager and a fair few others and another one of these big Amiga like is a composer the right way for it or who's responsible for the music anyway. So let's just dig into some of the development stuff. Now originally there was an ST and Amiga version of this which were like the primary focus that were being worked on but as the Super Nintendo came out and it was becoming a bigger and bigger system especially in like uh, UK and Europe they shifted the focus and made it all about about being for the Super Nintendo. Now they had just received a SNES development kit at the time, so it was all brand new to them and they were really eager to do something special. Now the Mega version doesn't have backgrounds and that's simply because they wanted to keep the game at a good frame rate. The Amiga 1200 simply didn't exist at this point and they were working on the A500 systems and stuff so they did the best they could but because it was like limited development time as well they had to do their best. Now they could have fixed the issues that happened with the Amiga I'm sure that because the backgrounds were linked to the frame rate but again when you haven't got the time left and you're rushing this out as a movie license you want it with the uh, actual release date for the film and they really had to pull their fingers out. And I'm sure they could have fixed a lot of the issues if they'd just had more time to do it. During the initial stages of development, they wanted the game to be more like pajama rama but as platformers were really starting to become like all the rage, I think this is like the knock-on effect of Super Mario World and Sonic to some degree, it just seemed a natural fit to squeeze the Adams Family world into 
Well, the Splatformer. Now, despite it being a movie license, they didn't actually receive any sort of uh, script or storyboards from the film. They only had pictures of the actual movie cast, which is a very strange thing to work off. So what they did was match the style of the game to the original TV show, which I think was out in the 60s, as well as the cartoons, which were doing another round at the time and getting very, very popular. When they did actually receive some info later on in development, it was simply too late, so they decided to base the entire story around the family being evicted from the home. That's sort of what's happening in the movie. It's a very simplistic story, so you could say the two were linked, but vaguely, it looked good enough for a movie tie-in title anyway. Doing some digging through developer interviews, it seemed that the original team behind the game were heavily influenced by Super Mario World. Oh God, it does keep popping up that one, doesn't it? Now, that can be seen in the way the actual game plays, as it's a very similar style to Mario World, but they decided to let Gomez have more free movement than what you would get over, say, in the Super Mario games, where it was very gravity-based. And because of this, you get a lot more free movement and a lot quicker movement when you're actually bouncing them around the levels. The license for it was seen as a pretty big deal by Ocean. They were even implementing focus testing to make sure the game was actually right, which is pretty unusual for the time. Again, this is the early 90s. Games were not seen as a big big marketing plus and a lot of the movie studios weren't really involved in like what happened to the licenses and stuff and this was still in those early stages as they were sort of coming round to it and it seems to show in the time the game was developed from what I could find out online it seemed to be just over a period of four months mainly focusing on the Super Nintendo edition and then a few weeks when they went back to the uh, original Amiga port and make it all link up and look pretty for each other I think anyway. Gomez as the main character runs at a much higher speed than everyone else in the game he's set to 60 or 50 frames per second with the rest of the enemy scrolling at around 30 to 20 five frames that doesn't mean much to me i'm afraid to say though looking at it when you play the game you can see a huge difference in speed and that's probably why gomez seems to be a, a lot faster than mario and even sonic i think to some degree it makes it feel really quick and it's a very neat trick what they've done there because it makes the game feel a lot faster than what it actually is now one of the big characters thing or the hand which is shown in the cutscenes, is not taken from the movie or any photoshops it's actually simon butler's the guy behind the uh, graphics and he created that in a single weekend which is quite impressive considering the tools they would have had to do this sort of thing at the time now it did have a sequel called pugley's scavenger hunt which was very very similar it used a very similar engine and they tidied everything up added more tricks and and made it more of a complicated game though it never sold anywhere near as much as the uh, original Amiga game and it never actually received an Amiga port which is uh, very odd for the time. Now, the Addams Family was ported to the Atari ST and the E, Nintendo Entertainment System, SNES, again that was the main, main version, Sega Master System, which did surprise me, and the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive. Now, all of these games are quite highly reviewed, doesn't matter which version you look at, so even as a kid going buying these back in the day, so you would have been happy with whatever version you ended up getting your hands on. Creepy, kooky, ooky, spooky, Morticia has been kidnapped. Uncle Fester has lost his memory and has fallen under the spell of Abigail Craven, a conniving character who is anxious to lay her greedy hands on the Adam's hidden fortune. Having recruited a misled Fester and assisted by her cohorts, Tully and the Judge, she manages to capture and imprison the other members of the Adams family within the huge Adams mansion. Only Gomez can save the day by freeing his son Pugsley, his daughter Wednesday and Granny and by restoring Vesta's memory. Accomplishing these tasks is daunting enough, but then Gomez must seek out Morticia in the underground vaults of the Adams Mansion and confront the evil judge in a kooky and spooky climax. Straight away, what an awesome starting story for a game. You can tell this one's been written a bit later because it doesn't really match what happens in the actual game itself. 
But then it's just a platformer, so let's not be expecting like Shakespeare from this. The game begins outside the Adams Mansion, and it's all old and rickety and falling to pieces, just like it looks in the TV show. And you play as Gomez. Now, this is a very cartoony version of the original TV show. The characters look identical, almost-ish, to the characters in a very sort of Looney Tunes way. So, big heads, slimish bodies, and nice chunky eyes, that sort of thing. To the top of the screen, it displays your score. Down the left-hand side, you see a list of hearts, lives, and dollars, which you collect as you're exploring the mansion. Now, the sprites for the characters are really huge. They really do stand out, and they have a sort of weightless feel when you control them, but there's enough gravity there that it doesn't feel like it's going too far, and it does move in a way that matches the characters you've got on screen. A lot of titles like this, you might have too big of a character or too small of a one and it controls oddly. Not here though. You know, Gomez can move it very quickly in all four directions. Fire to jump or use the fez which you can pick up. That's nice and simple. It just lets you fly and float around the screen. You can jump on top of enemies just to take them out. Typical Mario stuff. It has very quick, very responsive controls. Straight away as you start moving back and forth again, you're right outside the mansion. There's enemies to your left and right with a few exits and it's just great how it controls they are very very responsive you feel like you've got proper control of them just like you would in any other good platformer like say mario or sonic it is on par with a mario game right off the bat i'm very happy to say there are over a thousand screens to explore which are spread throughout the mansion and that in itself is divided into six stages each of which involves rescuing a member of the family which then places them in something called the music room and you've got like Lurch sat in the middle playing the piano and as you rescue each one they all appear there sat there getting involved well they don't really get involved in the actual game but it makes a cute little room you can visit in the mansion so I didn't say that before when you start outside you can go in through the main door and then it's like a step structure to see different doors to different parts of the mansion each of them involves a level usually in platformers that have this sort of freedom or let you go to different sections are always broken off you know you have to complete a few levels first like do the first three or do a small island before you can move on the great thing about this game is it's very free form you can go anywhere at any point so you can flip between different types of levels you can go right towards the much harder ones further at the end or you can take your time and learn your way up it doesn't restrict you in any way shape or form you begin with two hearts and you can collect up to three more. You have a total of five lives with infinite continues and passwords are given out pretty regular. Now you get lots of power ups to help you on your journey. Things like uh, an invincibility cloud, dollars, the flying fez as I said before. That's sort of like a, a Tommy Cooper reference. I think he was coming back in a big way in the 90s. It also lets you float briefly through the air which is almost like flying lying you have to keep tapping fire very rapidly there's also speed boots thrown in there which is very reminiscent of uh, sonic the hedgehog and it really does give you a turn of speed when you collect them and of course thing keeps appearing throughout the entire game to offer like simple advice and advance the story but the main point of the game is to explore the huge levels and the mansion itself you're pretty much left to do whatever you want to do as mentioned earlier, Gomez is much quicker than anything else within the mansion and he moves at a pretty amazing pace. It really is a fantastic like technical achievement to see this in action because you really do feel like you're fully in control and you can nip around and sort of like what Sonic the Hedgehog should have been really. I mean, it's at the expense of the issues with the frame rate, I suppose, and stuff, and sorry, the, the lack of the backgrounds though it gives it that turn of speed that the uh, other versions don't have. The graphics within the game are really gloomy, yet they're also incredibly gorgeous. It definitely has some of the best sprite works I've seen, especially for this time period around 91-92. It's filled with piles upon piles of enemies and they're all very spooky like ghosts and haunted things. I think there's even rabbits and odd stuff in there. 
they really have gone to town with the number of characters included and a lot of these might repeat in some of the levels but it's only within that actual section of the mansion you're in so you're not getting like copy and paste stuff across all of the levels and it does mean that they're quite unique to some areas and it makes parts of the mansion look pretty good little bits of dialogue do appear throughout each of the areas which you get by uh, tapping it's like things box which help push the atmosphere of the game really does feel like you're in the Adams family world and I like the little touch of the graphics and the little brief paragraphs you do get tend to be quite funny and humorous and it does push you on to explore more and more of the mansion one of the most outstanding things of the game has to be the music especially that opening theme it really does do a good rendition of what appeared on the original show and i'm assuming that's what they really use for the movie and stuff it sounds on par it's there it's what it should be and the fact that i was bopping along and i've included it as the main tune i've picked to show off in the show should show you how good i thought it actually was it really does have some amazing spooky and sort of dangerous tunes and often a lot of them are very cheeky and mixed in with this bit of dark humor as well it's really worth listening to some of the songs in this now the sound effects are as you would expect them to be they don't go too far over the top and it makes it more fun because they tend to be matched to the area you're actually in so it's not like it's copy and paste those sound effects and then chuck them out all over the shop no they really do go overboard with the amount of sound and music that mixed into this game and they don't always do this with amiga titles and i was very pleased to see that they've gone that extra level and really gone overboard with it in typical platformer style, there's also a very good range of bosses to levels. None of these are too taxing and it's all very simplistic patterns which you have to learn. But like one in particular that stood out was like the bird flying around the trees with the, uh, with the eggs in the nest very very detailed neat little ideas and you can really tell that a lot of love has gone to the design of the levels and the bosses and so on it really does stand out and puts it above a lot of other stuff that was on the market at the time no game of course is ever perfect and it does have its uh, share of issues first up the lack of backgrounds behind the actual levels now if you played any other version of this on any other system it really is a big problem every part of the mansion in the other versions is there you know if you're in the vault and you can see the piles of cash you're in the kitchens with the counter and they're only like simple designs but in this for the technical aspect they've removed them all and just made it black and it really can spoil the exploration of these different areas because as you go into somewhere new it'll be like a different type of floor say it's like wooded for a forestry area or ice when you're in like the kitchen or the, the ice type levels or the sewer that sort of thing the only thing that changes is the floor itself and the enemies i suppose to tie it all together and that's a real shame on the other versions there are room names when you go into each part of the mansion and you can easily figure out where you actually are just at a glance and it stands out usually at the top of the screen but the Amiga port doesn't have this whatsoever and although you can figure it out it's just a little bit of an annoyance which happens all the time and it just sort of interfere with me wanting to go and explore different parts of the mansion because they all effectively look the same it just got slightly you know different enemies and stuff dotted around i think as well if you played any of the other versions this one does not have the weapon which is effectively a sword and it's only got a single button now that's not something you'll notice if you've only ever played the amiga version because the game is good enough to enjoy aside from that it doesn't really cause any issues but it's a bit like knowing that in super mario brothers you can sling the uh, fireball if you can collect the flower and then you get to this and you know you can do the same but then you never see the actual weapon to collect the sword to bounce around with and if you played anything else it's just a little niggle in the back of your mind it's always there all right well this part will be much much easier i could just fly through this bit and you know use a little tiny bit of combat it just adds a bit more to the game it's a real shame that they couldn't put it in and you yeah that's about it for the problems there's not really very many at all the game does use a password system to skip the levels which means there's no actual disc saving that should always be a problem with huge games like this again though you can just tap in a password it's nice and short and simple it's not anything overly complicated so i'll forgive it for that easily 
let's have a look at the magazine scores. Now, most of them absolutely love this game. See You Amiga gave it 95%. Amiga Action, 94%. The One, 90%. Then Amiga Power, dropping off a bit at 88%. And lastly, Amiga Format, which is probably the lowest, at 78%. It really was seen as a triple-A game across the board and even Amiga Format didn't pick too many issues with it. It's a bit of an odd score really for them. Now for me, I really, really do want to love this as a game on its own. And I can see why all the magazines were going crazy about it and rating it so highly. And it probably has one of the best ever renditions of that classic theme. I mean, that's true Amiga music power there. But its biggest crime is removing the names and the backgrounds. Because for me, again, this is just my opinion. You might differ from me because this is a very, very big Amiga game. This is as close to AAA as the Amiga gets. But for me, it just felt a bit empty. I still often go back to the SNES version and I just feel with these missing elements that I just don't want to go back to the Amiga one even though it is a good game it's just missing too much and for once I'm sorry to say that graphics really do matter and I really do wish they'd have been able to get them backgrounds in and I can understand like you don't know, using the room names at the top it's just a bit of fluff but again it just adds to that little bit especially when you're in like a dark blackish mansion and there's nothing in the background and there's no text telling you where you actually are. The rest of the game though is, is gold, they just get so much right and it's just a real shame. The speed of the game and the way Gomez dots around and the way it works against the enemies, it's fantastic. The music is absolutely lush. The characters and the, the levels and the enemies and stuff, it all looks great. There's lots and lots to see and do, but for me there's a more definitive version out there. So it's the Super Nintendo one, that's the one that will all always draw me back and I just wonder why should I play the Amiga one when I've got access to this at the same time. As a kid though if I would have had a choice between all the different versions I would go for the Super Nintendo one every single time. Stuff like the lack of the sword as a pickup that's very annoying and though it isn't game breaking I think with a bit of fiddling of the controls or I don't know maybe something like a down and fire or fire and then tapping up to use it to slash it could have been put in there or even assign it just to a key on the keyboard if they didn't want to go past the joystick there's different things they could have done as a pickup and it's a real shame that they're just not bothered with it but overall this is a fine game it just struggles to break the surface you know if only it had those extra bits just to push it past and truly be wanted like the Amiga's greats it's just sadly for me it just doesn't go far enough it's just lacking in a few areas where if it had just that got a little bit more there they'd just been able to get past them parts I'd have been all for it a lot of that though, it's all based on time and place. I experienced this on the SNES back in the day. Coming to this, it feels like a lesser version of a fuller game. You might not have tackled this at all. In which case, I would say go for the Amiga version because you're an Amiga fan like me. It's always the first place to go. Try and keep away from the SNES version because it might just push you over the edge and keep you away from what is a very, very competent and very good platforming game for the Amiga. It's one of those games you really, really need to try and decide for yourself. Don't let some monkey like me tell you what's right or wrong. You might love this game to bits and in which case, good on you. Games are there to be played. And that sadly brings us to the end of this week's show. As usual, I would just like to take a moment to send out a huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You can join this illustrious list on patreon.com slash amigarama and they are Adam Bradley, Darren Coles, Figgy CTZ, Graham Vebke, Glenn Milford, Jason Warns, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Retro Ravi, Richard Legg, Sneff and Treble. 
And if you have anything you'd like to say about this week's show, you can either drop me a line on lefarious at amigarama.com, pop along to Twitter, which is at amigaramapod, come along to the Facebook page, which I said before, or even just drop a comment over on the main Amigarama website, which is amigarama.com. Until next time, guys.